All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank uh, the organizers for the opportunity to tell you about our work on uh, evolutionary and ecological uh, genomics of uh, budding yeast carbon metabolism in the subphylum uh, Saccharomycotina. So carbon metabolism is the energy superhighway of life. Energy harvest and storage is really one of the most fundamentally important things that all organisms must do. Uh, plants, of course, painstakingly capture energy uh, from the sun and store it as carbon sources. And then lazy heterotrophs like us and like yeasts come along and take advantage of that resource. And so the way that yeasts partition uh, their, these resources is absolutely crucial to their ecology. And so a lot of the world that they see is a menu of possible carbon sources that they could uh, conceivably consume. And they make different decisions and they have different capabilities about uh, which carbon sources they can use and which carbon sources they're going to use first. They also make very different decisions about what they're going to do with it. We think uh, maybe if you're thinking about the budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the model yeast, you think all yeasts are highly fermentative. That's not true. Most yeasts actually prefer to respire all the way to carbon dioxide if given the choice. And of course, some of these other products are absolutely critical to the kinds of things that we want to make if we're thinking about biofuels or bioproducts. Uh, and I also have a portion of my lab that uh, works on tasty uh, beverages. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any of uh, that uh, translational research today, uh, but I just want to acknowledge that uh, the decisions that yeasts are making uh, is really important to the bioeconomy. So a few years ago, we set out to determine the genome sequences and phenotypes available for all known budding yeast species. And so we're trying to construct a genotype phenotype map across 400 million years of evolution. And that started at the USDA with our uh, collaborator, the late uh, Cleet Kurtzman, the leading taxonomist uh, in, in yeast biology. And one of the great things about taxonomic practice is that when you describe a yeast species, you're required to deposit it in two international collections. And one of those copies has now uh, uh, been made and moved all the way up to UW-Madison, uh, straight up I-39. Uh, and we have sequenced the genomes of every known species of budding yeast, nearly every known species using the Illumina platform. Uh, and then we've conducted high throughput growth uh, uh, experiments uh, using plate reader and stacker, uh, uh, quantitative growth experiments. And of course, you end up with a massive quantity of data that we analyze at UW and also with our close collaborator, uh, Antonis Rokas' lab at Vanderbilt. OK, so we're not the first people to dream about a yeast genotype phenotype map. Indeed, I would argue that started with the first eukaryotic genome, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Of course, uh, a few years later, 2004, people started to do uh, comparative genomics here. There were four new uh, yeast genomes with very different metabolisms, uh, a, a nice nature paper from the Genovores Consortium. And as a young assistant professor, I was very lucky to be uh, involved in an early uh, comparative project with JGI, uh, conducted by many of the people here in the room, including uh, uh, Igor and Rob Riley and Sajit, uh, uh, that sequenced 16 new genomes specifically focused on uh, yeasts of biotechnological uh, importance. Uh, a couple of years later, we published uh, a, a paper uh, of 332 species. And one of the things we showed is that uh, budding yeasts are uh, spread across uh, 12 major clades. And so just to kind of orient you to some of the yeasts you may have been interested in or heard of, there's the model genus uh, that includes Saccharomyces cerevisiae, as well as a number of industrial hybrids used to brew beer. There was a whole genome duplication affecting a subset of this tree about 100 million years ago. Uh, in the uh, biomedical world, of course, people think about Canada albicans. That's out in this uh, yellow clade. If you're a, a sour beer fan, you may know about Britannomyces, which independently evolved a very aggressive fermentative lifestyle. And then there are yeasts uh, in particular places in the tree uh, that have uh, traits that are of considerable interest for uh, bioenergy uh, uh, applications, such as the ability to ferment xylose, the second most abundant uh, sugar in plant cell walls, and the ability of many yeasts, uh, early branching yeasts, uh, to produce uh, large quantities of lipids, the so-called oleaginous yeasts, such as Urawea lipolytica, Lipomyces starkidae. So one of the things we learned by having this tree is that the yeast subphylum is really diverse. The Saccharomycotina have as much genetic diversity as the entire animal kingdom, and actually even quite a bit more than the entire plant Indeed, uh, this uh, really kind of puts the lie to how uh, yeasts uh, had traditionally been classified by taxonomists, in large part because people had been trying to do it by morphology for so long. And unfortunately, that leads to the kind of view here that um, 
Saccharomycotina are just this little narrow branch that's represented by Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, but in fact, if you actually look at the sequence diversity, uh, the budding yeast subphylum actually has the most uh, sequence diversity of any subphylum in either the Basidiomycota or Ascomycota. What happened is that taxonomists had underclassified it uh, and essentially made uh, the subphylum equivalent to the class and order. Um, we have proposed a correction to that, uh, led by uh, Merzit Grunewald at the Restrodite Institute. Uh, we propose, uh, using genome sequence data now, that there should be seven classes uh, and 12 orders corresponding to those 12 major clades. And I think that that's going to help people uh, interact with the scale of data in a way that makes it more comparable to what's going on across the rest of the fungal phylogeny. So uh, a couple uh, take home points uh, from this prior work here. Uh, Yeasts are highly diverse, I told you that. And I'm not gonna show you any data, but it's important to kind of set up the questions I'm gonna to try to answer in the last few minutes with the full data set here. Uh, and th that is that yeasts have trait syndromes based on primary metabolism. And th those uh, are because uh, traits uh, overlap with one another uh, in interacting networks. The other major theme that we learned from this work and over, over the last five years or so is that trait and gene loss are really major factors in diversification. And so a lot of what's going on to create diverse yeasts through evolution is actually not gaining traits or genes, but losing traits and genes across the phylogeny. So how can that loss lead to the diversity, diversification? And indeed, what are the consequences of these highly interconnected carbon metabolism pathways for function and for evolution? Uh, I'm pleased to announce we have a manuscript uh, under review right now. You can read it on uh, BioArchive that uh, completes the data set. Um, and so we have 1,154 uh, yeast genomes. So it's over 1,000 genomes. It actually includes a number of candidates for new species uh, that we know uh, mainly by their genome sequence. Um, and we have quantitative growth data for 24 growth conditions, which include 18 carbon source conditions and six nitrogen conditions. We also have a new uh, environmental ontology that describes where all of the taxonomic type strains for the various yeast species uh, were isolated. Uh, you can note a, a couple of things. We've expanded specific parts of the tree that were undersampled, especially notably uh, in, in the yellow, the Serenales, where Canada albicans is, has gotten a lot bigger. Uh, also the, uh, in red, the Dipodescales, uh, which include a lot of those oleaginous yeasts, were also very undersampled, and now their uh, sampling is a lot more uh, complete. The other thing you'll note looking at, at that environmental ontology is if we look at kind of five uh, higher uh, level classifications, uh, there's just a lot of dynamism uh, in terms of uh, whether things are on plants or victuals or environment. Uh, this is a, a, these traits, their ecology is evolving very, very quickly. So another thing that we wanted to do is to classify yeasts as either generalists or specialists. And we did this using that carbon source data. Think back to that menu I talked about of all the possible things that they could eat. And what we did is we defined generalists as those that can eat a lot of things from that menu. They're not gonna be that picky. They can eat uh, uh, a wide variety of carbon sources and specialists as those that are just gonna eat a handful of carbon sources. And we use this statistical method to split them uh, into three categories, a little more than 75% of them we classified as standard, and then a little more than 10% each we classified as generalists and specialists, again, based on the number of things that they could eat or their carbon breadth. And so the first thing we wanted to do was ask whether there were trade-offs. And that there's a long-standing literature in ecology that hypothesized that the jack of all trades is the master of none. And so our prediction was, looking at that literature and thinking about it, is that if you had a high carbon breadth, you're maybe not going to grow as fast on the carbon source as you can. Whereas if you have a low carbon breadth, so if you're a specialist, you better do really well on the things that you can eat. And indeed, that's exactly the opposite of what we saw. We saw that in general, in yeasts, generalists are growing better across the board. And I'm going to show you two ways of uh, coming to that conclusion. The first one is just to look at carbon breadth and uh, look at uh, growth rate. And what we see is that generalists uh, actually are tending to grow faster. They're more likely to end up in a fast uh, or intermediate category, where specialists are more likely to end up in a slow category for growth. And so the more carbon sources you grow on, the faster you tend to grow in general. Second, the carbon breadth correlates with nitrogen breadth. And so if you're a carbon generalist, you might have expected that you would be a nitrogen specialist, but in fact, it's the exact opposite. Uh, there's not a trade-off here. If you're a carbon generalist, you tend also to be 
a nitrogen field. We then used our genome sequences to look for features using a random forest machine learning model uh, that we could use to classify yeasts as generalists or specialists, just looking at their genome sequence information. And we did pretty well. Uh, about 90% uh, of the specialists we could get right, about 90% of the generalists we could get right. Uh, on the left uh, here is a confusion matrix that just visually shows what you want, is, is the, the black uh, kind of diagonal there, uh, and, and then the, the white uh, is, are the ones that we got wrong. And then another way of looking at that is a uh, uh, receiving operating characteristic curve uh, or, or rock uh, curve. And there, what you want is uh, instead of a diagonal cross, what you want is kind of an upside down L. And you can see uh, in that blue line with our uh, error bars that we actually do pretty well. We're a lot closer uh, to, to that upside down L. OK, so what genes are driving that classification system? What is allowing us to split yeasts into generalists and specialists based just on uh, genome content. And so I'm going to show you the top four uh, genes, or at least their pathways. I, they have specific CAG numbers that nobody will remember unless you're looking it up on your phone, but the paper's right there. Uh, the top uh, bit of information actually comes from complex one of the electron transport chain. This is something that we know is highly variable in budding yeast. It's really important to the energy balance and respiration, and indeed to the whole slew of other genes in complex one, even after you account for this, that are major factors in whether you're going to be a generalist or a specialist. The second is a beta manosidase. This is important because this fungal cell wall has a lot of mannan in it. Complex uh, 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 glycosylation patterns decorate a lot of proteins. And so we expect, again, for uh, consuming uh, other fungi and cell walls, this is something you want to have. Near and dear to my heart, especially my work at Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center trying to engineer yeast for uh, xylose metabolism, is the pentose phosphate pathway comes up as being a critical way of managing flux and flexibility in budding yeast. And it's probably a part of why it's so hard to get Saccharomyces cerevisiae and more specialized aggressive fermenters to run things through this pathway. This may be something generalists are just better at. Uh, and then finally, uh, carnitine biosynthesis comes up as important, several genes in there. Carnitine is really important to kickstarting certain types of respiratory metabolism, especially on uh, non-fermentable carbon sources. Okay, last uh, question before I wrap up, and that's, okay, we've shown you that we can predict generalists and specialists by looking at genome sequences. We also want to look at how they've evolved over time. Uh, and if you noticed, remember, the uh, yeast ecology is actually very dynamic. They're actually making a lot of transitions. And so if we create a Bayesian model and ask whether generalists are evolving differently than the rest of the phylogeny, uh, we can model whether they're making these transitions between uh, growth or no growth on a particular condition. And what we've done here is we've ranked uh, all of the carbon sources by how frequently they're used in generalists. And then if we look here on the bottom left, the whole tree, those bottom ranking carbon sources, they're all loss, 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 right? That's that pervasive trend of gene loss and trait loss that we see across the phylogeny. But that's not what you see for generalists. They're holding on to traits once they have them. Similarly, uh, if you as you go up, they're even actually, in some cases, maybe actually gaining traits. And so that is what makes generalist specials. They're losing fewer traits uh, than the rest of, of the yeasts, and they're maybe even gaining some traits. So with that, I just want to uh, give you the final couple of bullet points here. This is kind of where we started. Uh, but I'm going to argue that uh, generalists are actually growing more uh, robustly than specialists. They are not the... Uh, Jack of all trades, master of done. They actually have more robust metabolism. And it's because of those trait syndromes and those interconnections between pathways, I think, make them more flexible, make the metabolism more flexible. And finally, they got that way by losing fewer treats, by holding on to the genetic pathways, metabolic pathways that they have, um, and also by gaining some traits. With that, I want to thank uh, all the people who did the work, especially I have highlighted uh, uh, Dana Apulente, a postdoc in my lab, who's now a professor, and Abigail uh, Labella. Postdoc in Rokas Lab, who's also a professor, they're the lead authors of this study, did really important uh, uh, work, as well as a uh, number of the other people on here. And I want to acknowledge uh, this project was funded uh, mainly by the National Science Foundation, but I'm also grateful uh, to Great Lakes uh, Bioenergy Research Center for providing a forum uh, in, in which we can look at translating these discoveries to biofuel and bioproduct production. Um, and uh, of course, uh, to JGI for that early uh, study that I mentioned and our ability to be involved in that. So thank you. Thank you.
Do we have questions? Thanks, Chris. Great talk. Uh, most of your carbon sources are sugars, actually. If you had to engineer a yeast to additionally consume one of these other sugars, it sounds to me like it would only be a small thing that needs to be done. Would the results change if you had um, considered also other more exotic or completely different carbon sources? It, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and so yeasts are uh, a, a little pickier than sort of bacteria writ large, you know, despite that we, we can be really impressed by their uh, diversity compared to other eukaryotic groups, but compared to bacteria, um, they certainly have not explored the same metabolic space. And so what we were focused on uh, sugars that from the taxonomic literature we knew were reasonably commonly used, although there's a few that are pretty rare. Um, a number of those are actually uh, uh, non-fermentable carbon sources, such as glycerol, uh, ethanol is a non-fermentable carbon source. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think you know we had to make choices about uh, uh, how many how many things to phenotype. Uh, you know, we certainly can go back and do it and run the plate stacker, you know, on whatever else. But but there's a balance about you know making sure that. We're not just looking at a bunch of blank plates if we if we ask them to use something that no yeast is known to use. Yeah, I I, I'm just wondering if there's a what is the big loss for them? I mean, it seems to me it's only two genes sometimes that are needed to consume this additional sugar. What makes a specialist save so much by not being able to do that anymore? Yeah, I, you know, I think we need to take uh, neutral hypotheses seriously, too. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be that they're saving, uh, right? Um, and, and so um, some of these losses could be neutral. Some of the losses that yeast have undergone, they then come to regret uh, later. So, for example, galactose metabolism has been lost more than a dozen times. Uh, was one of the things that was in, in the study with AGI. Uh, some of those losses occurred 100 million years ago in clades that have radiated in all light galactose metabolism, except that they then got it back by horizontal gene transfer. Um, and I, I, you know, I think that's, uh, th there's probably a lot of that going on. I mean, if I had to pick other carbon sources that we would test, I would pick uh, some of the higher uh, oligosaccharides that we didn't test that are expensive, like maltotriose, uh, cellotriose, uh, uh, cellotetraose. Uh, those are really important to being able to process some of the plant hydrolysis. Uh, uh, that are incompletely digested. Uh, and there's, uh, based on the work we know of uh, from some of the groups that can ferment xylose and can consume cell biostructure, we, we know that yeasts are able to consume, some, some yeasts are able to consume some of these higher, uh, bigger, bigger molecules. Uh, but it, those are mostly one-off cases. And I bet if we looked through the entire tree, we would find, we would find more of them. And when we found more of them, we would probably learn a lot about the genetic basis. Okay, we sorry, we have to move on to our last speaker. So uh, let's thank Chris again.